Hey, everybody. Just going to uh, get this thing all set up and ready to go. Hope you're having a lovely Wednesday evening, wherever you might be. Looking forward to this. This is going to be fun, of course. <laughs> so just wanted to uh, welcome you to Wednesday nights with Wade here on the Knoxville Raceway Facebook page. G'day to Jason Fleming, Marcus Varnholtz, Mike Merritt, Donnie Wilson. Uh, if you get a chance, tell me where you're watching from. Um, I can't always read them all out, but it's uh, always good to say hello when I can. Hello to Tammy Helms from Lincoln, Nebraska. Dustin Lanchell as well. Uh, this is gonna be heaps of fun. We already know that. The guy's got a reputation. He'd have, uh, he'd have fun at a tax convention, my next guest. Uh, looking forward to next week. Uh, what I'm hoping that we'll be doing is speaking to Matt Barbara and Gio Selzy. Uh, that's going to be really cool. Uh, we kind of had a bit of a chat about that before we got started. So Matt reached out. So I'm um, looking forward to catching up with Matt and Gio Selzy uh, this time next week. Get out to Robert Armstrong from Iowa. Pierre Jensen from snowy Minneapolis. Yeah, I see it's snowing in Minneapolis. Yeah, Minnesota's got it coming down we got sioux city iowa denham springs louisiana that's a good one we got texas we got marshall we got simpson victoria australia now i've got to talk slower for doug old because uh, doug's got his little translator app uh, for me just want to do a little bit of housekeeping here um the knoxville raceway winter apparel merch is now available. Get across knoxvilleraceway.com for all the information on the new range of winter uh, items. I'm sure you're gonna love them. There's some really, really cool looking stuff on that. So jump on knoxvilleraceway.com. Don't forget too that the Knoxville Nationals for 2021 has been locked in from August 11 to 14. And if you know that event well, you know it's an incredible lead up to that that involves the 360 Nationals as well. Uh, just couple of weeks before, a few weeks before that, the Corn Belt Nationals is on as well. And of course, the amazing Capitani Classic as well. So such an incredible place. Hey, we've got Tim Archie Engelhart watching from the Philippines. Gotta love that. Harrisburg, South Dakota, Springfield, Illinois. Very cool. Either the home of the mile or the Simpsons, whichever you want to roll with. Um, so it's going to get over to St. Helena in California, where Rico is standing by. Johnny Whitehouse watching from Werribee, Victoria, Australia. Newport News, Virginia, Missouri. Very cool, lots of cool places. So without further ado, let's jump over. If you want to um, try and you can throw some questions at us, but it gets fairly intensive and the messages are just blazing through here at the moment. So Ed West from Kentucky. Now that is cool. Do you know what, 2007, I was traveling across America, driving across America, and I got to Louisville, Kentucky. And I thought, what am I going to do tonight? I got to the motel. I'm like, eh, what do I do? And I looked at what was on in Kentucky in that area that night. And Bill Cosby was doing stand up. And I chose between going to Bill Cosby live or going to Bloomington, Indiana. And I went to Bloomington and I watched Brad Sweet win the non wing race, which was bad ass. So, I think I made the right decision there. Wouldn't have minded a bit of stand up, but it was very cool to watch Brad Sweet smack him at Bloomington. All right, let's go. Let's do this. Let's go to the home of Shop Rico. Bill Cosby was doing stand up. Now, there we go. He's going to have to turn his audio down a little bit. Hey, guys. Hey, mate. Uh, how you doing? Good. <laughs> it's a bit of a process. Uh, did you manage to share it out before we got yeah, started? Yeah, I just got it. I think I'm good. <laughs> It's funny, isn't it? Because you can be so calm and relaxed, Rico, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, God, I didn't when know I it was quick. It was a little delayed. So we're good now, though. Yeah, cool, okay. mate. Hey, it's good to see you. I got to say, before we even get started, how good is your hat? This is uh, one of my all time favorites, an old Ascot hat. It, uh, it's got a little dirt on it from the last few years I've been wearing it. One of the uh, Agajanians gave it to me at oh. Turkey Night. So it's really, uh, 
I think actually JC gave it to me. So it's really, really special to me. Wow. That is cool. And you know what? With the, with the hat and the mullet and the mustache and I can uh, rip it right now. The more dirty the hat is, the more it seems to suit that whole deal anyway. You don't want a like a crisp new Ascot hat. No, I love it. Yeah, cool, man. Hey, um, lots to get through tonight. Thank you very much for coming on Wednesday nights with Wade. Um, what would you normally be doing right now if you weren't doing this, by the way? Um, so uh, these last few weeks, my brother has a, a garden and uh, we've been, um, he has a pumpkin patch as well. So we've been uh, getting the pumpkin patch ready for uh, Thursday through Sunday. So we've been doing quite a bit of his pumpkin patch the night before. Uh, just to get it all prepped for uh, all our locals to come buy some pumpkins. Surely you're going to do a pumpkin with a mullet. Surely that's on the menu. We're uh, we're carving pumpkins this weekend, so uh, that's I got the hair. I could add a little bit. I could do <laughs> a little off right here and uh, add some to uh, to a nice pumpkin. There's um, a really great Leonardo DiCaprio movie, um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, that, that I really love, and Brad Pitt's in it, and. He plays this sort of cowboy and he's got, you know, the hat and he's got the, they, they give him the beard and the jacket. You can almost roll the old cowboy sort of roll into town with that look, mate. I could, uh, that would be, uh, that would be something else right there. Um, so how's your beautiful missus? How's Megan going? What's to go with yeah, her? She's good. Uh, she's out to dinner tonight with some friends, but we, uh, she's been super busy with our online store. She went home uh, with her sister to help plan for her sister's wedding. And now she's back and, the store's uh, been busier than ever, so it's uh, it's good to keep us up to speed. And we're going to run uh, one more race here at the end of the year uh, for Peter Murphy in the Charleston Memorial or Charleston Classic race. Uh, so I'm looking forward to getting down to Hanford and racing with everybody. I know you're great mates with Peter. Um, I don't know of anyone who would say a bad word about Peter Murphy. It's almost like he's got three passports. He's got a New Zealand um, fan base. He's got American fan base and us Aussies. You know, he's just the most loved man I know, mate. Peter's awesome. Uh, I love calling Peter and discussing, um, you know, he's, he's so good with working with the racers and the fans. Uh, to make, uh, you know, him being in the promoting business now to make the racing, not only the racing, but um, the fan experience better at uh, Hanford or Keller Auto Speedway. So, um, you know, he does such a good effort or he puts in such a good effort that um, it's good that I get down there and support him. Uh, you know, I love racing at Hanford and, uh, you know, racing with Peter is, uh, you know, and someone behind such a great promoter like him is, is uh, he does an unbelievable job. And you know what? We're so lucky we still got him around, Rico, because, you know, the, the whole reason he's a promoter is because he can't race anymore because of that frightening crash um, that he had, which we almost lost him. And, and I think that's made Pete appreciate his beautiful wife, Steph, and his, his fantastic boys. I think he's he's even more focused on living life to the fullest these days. And he's up at the gym at 4.30 in the morning every day. And he's a changed man these days, Rico. He's a hard worker. Um, you know, he, he and he's a great guy. I love I love getting to talk to him and being able to call him up uh, on a Sunday afternoon and, and talk to him about how he did that weekend racing. And, um, you know, he sees it on both ends, which is really cool, uh, you know, from being a racer and now a promoter, he can see both sides of it and understand both sides and make our whole sport better. And, um, you know, a lot of people, uh, you know, can look, look off of what the things he's doing and, bringing from, um, you know, his experience in New Zealand and Australia on the promotional yeah. side to, to the U S and, um, you know, his, his race we do every year at Tulare, uh, you know, it's unfortunate we didn't get to be there this year, uh, you know, due to all the COVID stuff, but, um, you know, I, I got the, I was lucky enough to win it last year or a year and a half ago. And, um, that's one of my favorite races and one of my bucket list races. So mate, tell me, let's go back to the very beginning with all this sort of stuff. Did anyone else in the Avery family race? No one. Um, they raced motorcycles. Uh, that was about it, though. There's a Tom Abreu that used to race at Calistoga Speedway out here in California, but there's no uh, same spelt last name, same, uh, you pronounce it the same, uh, but he, there was no relation that I know of. Um, so uh, I'm the only racer in our family besides uh, maybe my brother racing down the highway and his hot rod. 
it's pretty cool because it's kind of similar with Kyle, you know, like there's no, there's no generations um, above Kyle where he can go, well, that you can trace where my passion for racing and his ability came from. He just, boom, it just started from there. So, and you have a connection with him that goes way back. You were dirt bikes first. And then where did you go from there? Um, I went to outlaw carts and that's where I really got to know uh, Kyle and build that friendship. And uh, man, you would think for how good he is, it's in, it's been in his bloods or his blood for a lot of generations uh, so it's it's really cool to see his success right now it's really appreciating to see that and um to know him and and us racers and um fans that really know who he is uh to you know that's uh it's it's just really cool to see his success yeah absolutely you know it's funny because i thought the same thing i'm thinking okay so if his dad didn't race and his granddad didn't race and where does it come from but you know what aj foyt mario andretti those guys were badasses right off the get-go as well. So it's not like, you know, the, the later Andretti's and the Unzas and people like that. Yes, they had that history, but somebody had to start being the badass. Yeah. Well, we can, uh, between Kyle and myself, we can start it now and hope that our family, uh, you know, I know he's got Owen in there racing, so that's, that's a good start. So my understanding is that you were having a race in your backyard, like a charity race uh, with, with your karting and, and by chance, or you invited Kyle along or he came along and then you guys started to talk about racing sprint cars or other forms. Is that kind of how it rolled? Yeah, it's uh, so we did a race um, just to get some friends over and some friends that I raced against at go-karts and Kyle was uh, racing at Calistoga Speedway for the Louis Vermeil classic Labor Day weekend. And we had like a barbecue shindig and he uh, came over and gotten one of the house QRC carts and we all ripped around there. And then our friendship kind of built from there. Uh, and one of my father's business partners ended up sponsoring him that weekend and kind of got Kyle, um, you know, in a good position with the Kading family. And that's kind of what led me to, um, in my beginning of my sprint car years in 2011, Brent Kading built me a sprint car and Kyle's parents uh, highly recommended the Kading family. And that's kind of what started, uh, you know, my whole sprint car open wheel career uh, is, you know, Brent Kading and Kyle's, Kyle and his parents, uh, you know, moving us in that direction to do business with the Kadings. I think I went to, um, I think it was Hanford. It was my first look at Californian sprint car racing. And it was for an event, I'll never forget it, the Spanky Matthews Memorial. And they basically had BK roll around and do like a parade lap with the American flag out the side of the car. And then they just threw the green and BK just did like 10 laps on the hammer with the flag out the side, one handed. I seen Tim Kading do that. And I thought it was the coolest thing ever. Yeah. So the Kadings were integral. It, it, it's all enmeshed. And, um, and Stu McCarthy did a great interview with you, my buddy from Parramatta, uh, for his Chatting with Stu Rat podcast. And you said the Kadings were actually responsible for building the mechanical aspects of the car that are unique for your needs, yeah? Yeah. So um, Brent and Bud and Brian Matherly, um, they actually designed uh, the cockpit of my sprint car. That's the only thing that's different on my car is um, – Obviously, with my shortness and stature, I sit a little bit closer and uh, my feet have like these big shoe boxes underneath them so I can reach the pedals. And Brent, uh, Bud and Brian designed that. And then they had um, a fabricator in San Jose, John Santamaro, that does a lot of business for um, Kadings on the fabrication side, designed the or he built the structure of the cockpit. And then yep. Um, honestly, I, I, it's all still the same, like none of it's changed, which is really cool. You know, this is, um, I believe going to next year is going to be my 10th season racing. Yeah. So, uh, you know, in 10 years, you would think, uh, I would have found something a little different, but I, I'm so comfortable in my car that we haven't changed anything. You said something to Stu, which astounded me that there are some people that actually think something quite remarkable about you in the car. Do you recall that people actually think of how, you, how you're in the car that people so fans think that I stand up and drive <laughs> <laughs> so I uh you know obviously don't I sit down like every other race car driver um you know I'm just sat three you know six to six and a half inches I think it is closer and then my feet are up six and a half inches so I'm away I'm, I'm kind of um in a little safer aspect in the cockpit just because I'm away from the rear end um, where it can't really come up and hit the seat. Um, and then the, my feet are 
just above the the torque tube so there would never be um you know an incident like tony stewart had uh, where the yeah. torque tube kind of came out of the car and um you know hit his leg does it physic with the physics of the car then does changing your body position in the car do you think that has any sort of effect on how it handles i think it gives you um a little bit better center of gravity um you know and you don't have that weight transfer like um you know 150 or 200 pound driver would be i uh you know i i am pretty sure like when i race the midgets for keith coons or the sprint cars i'm probably still um you know they everyone does such a hard good job getting light cars at the chili bowl getting their cars really light and i still think i have at least 30 pounds on everybody you know i only weigh 95 pounds so um you know anyone who works hard to get their cars light um you know i think i'm still lighter than all of them at the chili bowl <laughs> that's got to piss some people off rico he's like damn he's got he's up over the center of the car he's up over the wheel he's 45 pounds lighter than me okay. someone's eventually yeah. got to get pissed off yeah i'm pretty lucky to be like that you know how competitive people are mate i know i have, I have a big advantage and i don't got to do much how um does Californian racing growing up in that in that in industry, although you left there to sort of travel nationally as well, how does California compare? Everybody thinks in Pennsylvania that the PA posse are the guns. Everyone in the Midwest thinks Iowa or Ohio or Indiana. How does California compare West Coast across the scene, do you think? Yeah, I think it's um very, very uh stout competition. Uh, you know, it reminds me a lot of kind of the competition in central Pennsylvania and, and, and Indianapolis, you know, when you roll into those local tracks, you always see the results here in California when the outlaws come to town that, you know, five out of the top 10 or California locals guys. And, um, you know, that just shows how competitive uh, California and it's all kind of short track racing. So it's a different style than the Midwest where you have, you know, big cushions out here and, uh, you know, the, the tracks don't necessarily get as slick as like an Ohio, you know, Eldora Speedway would get. Um, but it's, it's just a different, unique style of racing. And, and that's kind of what I grew up around where it's more hammered down, you know, Australian style racing. Uh, and it's, it's taught me um, some good habits and bad habits for when I get, you know, when I come home uh, and race from racing in the Midwest on slicky e tracks, uh, you know, for six months, and then you come home and you got to, you know, instead of having an egg under your throttle pedal, trying to be smooth, you kind of got to go the other way with it. And you can, you can get away with, uh, you know, with murder on some of these small tracks. And for many years too, Rico, California, you know, and, and even further east, Arizona, and places like that, non-wing racing is phenomenal. Like the golden era of Ascot, you know, the CRA stuff, um, the, then the SCRA stuff, you got tracks like Paris that are just, Drury pleasure domes for non-wing racing so you probably could have gone either way with that yeah um you know so i started in a wing car the first like four years i i raced all wing cars and i never had any non-wing experience and then um you know paul silva and i decided to do the louvre mill classic at calistoga speedway and uh, it was probably the most fun i've ever had in a race car where it's um but you realize too like i'm going way fast than I expect you know and how you see those non-wing crashes and yeah I've crashed midges before so I know how it feels when you don't have that extra cushion of a wing to slow you down when you're wrecking so um you know I did uh there was a three-year stretch where I did the non-wings at Calisoga and I had a lot of fun and a lot of success because my car was so good uh but um you know I've kind of rolled back from that direction of non-wing racing just because I think wing racing uh, is where the money's at and the, you know, the, the number one top competition. What I love Rico about our sport is we are still celebrating the role of a great crew chief. Uh, when you think back to the, the days when Carl Kinzer was the most celebrated, uh, you know, crew chief of all time working with the King in recent years, the guy you just mentioned, Paul Silver's name gets used a lot. Of course, the incredible success that Kyle's having, but you were actually working with Paul well before Carl. Yeah, I was, um, you know, I was lucky enough to race with Paul there for a five-year span and, uh, and had a lot of success. I think uh, I was looking back um, a couple of days ago on just my stats from those years and a lot of top fives and a lot of wins. Um, you know, I had a 19-win a race season with him where I won 19 races. I won 25 races in one year and 
it just shows, um, you know, driver chemistry, crew chief chemistry and, and how, um, how each other believe in each other. And you can really work magic with that. Um, and that's what, that's, what's so incredible with, um, seeing the success with Kyle and Paul is that the, the chemistry between them, them two and, you know, they've, they've raced together for, I think, eight or nine years now and where, you know, where they've gotten it to here in, you know, the ninth year, 10th year and whatever it's been. Um, I know it's been a while. I think it was Kyle raced for Paul a few times and then right before I kind of came into the picture with Paul Silva. So, um, you know, I instantly had success the first year with Paul Silva and then, uh, you know, the third or fourth year, it was really, um, you know, really, really successful seasons for me. Silver turns things to gold, mate. Yeah, he uh, he knows how to shake the magic wand at it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, silver crown racing, you know, champ car sort of stuff, uh, even pavement stuff like that. Is that something that you've dabbled in or that you ever really want to do more of? Yeah, so um, I've never, I've experienced a pavement midget, um, um, you know, dirt midget. I ran a non-link sprint car. I ran a micro. Um, I ran a munchkin on at the Rumble in Fort Wayne. Um, I want to run a silver crown car at Eldora and, uh, Springfield, and I want to run a late model at Eldora. And, um, after watching the port, the port Royal videos of Kyle beating up on those guys, I'd like to do that too. Yeah. The, the late models, they're just a challenge in themselves, aren't they? Donnie shots has proven that you can, you can take that talent across that genre. And obviously Kyle did as well. What is the challenge of late models for you? Do you think? Um, I don't think it's much really, uh, you know, I, I, there in 2016, I ran, um, you know, the truck series in with NASCAR camping worlds or whatever it's called now. But, um, <laughs> I, so I know they have like the dash, uh, the dashes in those cars or the frame where the frame, the cross frame goes across there and you can do hanging pedals off those uh, similar to what they did in my truck. I was, I, I sent shots, some photos cause I would, uh, I would like to do something with shots or Bloomquest or one of those guys that have competitive late models. Um, it would be a lot of fun. It's just a matter of making sure, you know, I'm comfortable in the car. And, you know, when you cross those cars up, if I have enough reach and stuff, which you can speed the steering boxes up in them and you can do all sorts of stuff. So I'm really interested and, and I just have to find the time and, and the commitment and, um, you know, make it happen. I know that you have two real heroes in different genres and Bloomer is certainly your tin top guy. He's, he's your go-to guy with late models, isn't he? He is, uh, you know, he's one of the best in the business. It's he's had an incredible amount of success racing late models and it's, it's obviously his, his job. So um, I've really enjoyed, um, you know, becoming friends with Scott Bloomquist and, and seeing that, you know, all the history behind him and the success and, um, you know, it's a little part of the reason why I have some long hair here too. Is is there a different Scott Bloomquist to the racetrack version? Is he is he less intense away from the track? Because he's a fairly imposing critter. He is. Uh, he is pretty intimidating. The 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 good the cool Scott Bloomquist moment I have was when we were at um, you know the the indoor race there in St. Louis, and um, you know Scott called me and wanted me to get on his shoulders like two minutes before driver intros. And I had to run all the way across the stadium to get on his shoulders. And it was probably the coolest moment I've experienced in my life. He's, um, he's polarizing too, Rico, because um, he gets, he pushes the boundaries. I think that's safe to say there's some pretty weird stuff that happens uh, around that race car at times in driver's briefings and things like that. So he's kind of like an outlaw. He doesn't care. He is the true definition of an outlaw. <laughs> and you and I share a racing hero. Um, you, he, he races for you occasionally. For me, I just stand back and still go, at 62 years of age, there will never be another Jack Horton child. He is uh, he's my number one guy. I, uh, I enjoy Jack. I enjoy our friendship. Um, you know, I got to spend some time with him over the summer and at his shop and stuff. So it's... Uh, He's really cool. I just, I just am always in awe with him, just the things he can do in a race car. And, um, you know, I wish I was, um, you know, I wish I got to see him race back when he was in the Pennzoil car and stuff. Cause I just heard those were the, you know, some wild times and, you know, I can only imagine being a fan watching him rip around there. 
I don't know if you if you read much at all, Rico, but the Brad Doty book, the Still Wide Open book by Dave Agrabite, is yeah. just so good. And Brad talks about a moment where they're up on a like a we call them a quarry in Australia. I don't know what you guys call them, like a a, a big sand pit, you know, stone pit. Yeah, rock quarry. Yeah, rock quarry. And um, there's like Ed Horton Child, Kenny Jacobs, Brad, Jack. There's a bunch of them all like kids standing there looking over the edge, you know, and they're like, "You jump, no, you jump." And all of a sudden they hear this and then woof, like Jack just clear over that thing. He didn't even look, he just sailed over the top and yeah, that sums it up. It. Yeah. He didn't even think about it. And that's what he does when he races. So I'm i uh, I'm going to run him one of these days on the outlaw tour or, or something where we really together. Yeah. I told him I would. And wow. I don't know if it's going to be next year or the year after, but we're going to make it happen. Rico, you've got to be proud too, I think, of the way Sheldon goes about what he does. I mean, he is a mini Jack, but he's he's very corporate savvy. Him and Zan have a really different way of doing things. And he's he's squeaky clean with the way he presents and the way he goes about it. But he's still got his old man's badass and ragged style. I know. I love Sheldon. Uh, you know, him and I have got to build a great relationship over the last few years here and as well as Megan and Zan. So Sheldon, uh, Sheldon's... Uh, a wild child that uh, is in the making to be one of the greatest in the country. We should have mentioned Pella because she's going to be upset if she didn't get a mention because uh, did you see she even went and did like a, a school tour the other day to talk about geography? I got, uh, I got Pella dog bowls and leashes all over my house here. <laughs> Pella's like the only dog that's been allowed to stay in my house. She is pretty amazing. She's a bit of a diva. Tell me about your brother and sister, because we don't hear too much about them. Um, obviously, let's talk about your sister first, because you, your brother, we're going to talk about fires and stuff in a minute. And I saw some of your Twitter posts, the respect and the incredible um, bravery that you have, you know, for what the way he acted in the fires. But tell me about your family. Yeah. So, um, you know, my sister just graduated her senior year of high school and she's um, she's been doing a little work for uh, my dad's business on the vineyard management side in the office. And then once uh, things kick back off so she can get to um, college, she's going to go down South and spend some time down there. And uh, hopefully she comes back sooner than, than later. Um, just because we all, our family's really close. Um, yep. You know, over the last few years here, we've all really understood each other's um, relationships as we've grown here and know, um, you know, when, when our younger days, we always kind of fought and bickered and, you know, how siblings get, um, and we've really grown over the last few years here and, um, spent a lot of time and enjoy spending time together. So, um, it's, it's good to see, um, you know, everyone in my family and, and the success paths they're taking, if it's in the vineyard management or the wine industry, or, you know, my sister getting out and, uh, and experiencing the real world that, you know, my brother and I have done in the last 10 years, uh, you know, which, and we're lucky that, you know, my father and mother um, have raised us really well to um, appreciate the things that we, we get to do. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's just, we're just lucky people. You're an interesting critter, mate, because if I looked at you from the outside, I wouldn't think that you would be sipping cab sav and, you know, being a wine connoisseur and stuff like that. But you really dig that stuff, don't you? That's really I your life. It. I love it. I mean, it's it's my life. And I, I've, I think traveling sprint car racing um and seeing different areas in the country and different um you know positions people are in i've i've really um realized how lucky i am to live here in the napa valley and and get to uh it gives you just a, a bigger appreciation of the wine industry and and the people around the wine industry and what makes it go around and that's that's why you know these fires that happened here and how um, you know, how heartbreaking they really are. Um, it's, you know, you guys have obviously experienced fires in yeah. Aust Australia and know kind of how, it, how it is, but like these, this is people's whole, whole lives, you know, being, you know, obviously they're, everyone's safe, but they're, um, you know, they're taking it. It's been taken away from them and that they've worked for generations and 1800 year old barns, you know, being burned down and just crazy times that, and that's when you really, um, you know, understand who, who people are around you. And, uh, you know, we've really, uh, I've really understood kind of what my dad has structured here in the last 40 years of, of his business model and understand, wow, this is why he does this stuff. 
And it, unfortunately, Rico, you can almost set your watch by it every year that California just gets ravaged by bushfires. It, it's yeah. really sad. It's it's unbelievable. The last uh, five years here, what it's, you know, four out of five years or three out of four years, how it's, how crazy it's been around here. And it's like, you know, every year we, you know, we thank the Lord for it not being, you know, in our backyard and we're helping our neighbors every year, it seems like to protect their ranches. And then, you know, this year it's in our backyard, you know, burning, you know, a block from our homes and, and our ranch where we've grown up our whole lives. And, you know, that's what we know and see every day. And now you have to come back and, you know, how do you, you, you know, it'll never be the same in our lifetimes here with, you know, what's going on. And now you have to prepare for this every year. And, yeah, um, because there is places that haven't burned in, in the valley and, uh, you know, and you have to go and protect those places now. Your brother obviously impressed you a lot, mate. Some of the tweet, tweets you're putting out, um, showing him literally, you know, on the ground level, putting out fires as best he could. So you obviously saw another side to your bro. Yeah. And, and it's, um, you know, it's almost bred in us or our blood to, to help others. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always, we're always looking at ways to, um, to make people feel comfortable or safe or, you know, and during these fires, I mean, there's, it's scary because there's just fire, there was fires everywhere. So it's hard to be in, you know, two or three different places at once when there's, you know, craziness going on. And, um, you know, I'll tell you a little story here for everyone to hear, but there's, there was a time where, where the, the firefighters came to our ranch or came to the ranch we were working on and, and said, we have to leave because we're all going to die out here. And my brother turned around and said, I'm not leaving. And, you know, I'm here thinking like, we're all here together and we're not going to leave, you know, I'm not going to leave. And, you know, so we, you know, everything ended up being okay, but it's, it's a matter of, you know, you really, you really understand who somebody is and their character when you're put in, uh, you know, situations like that. And, um, you know, it just makes relationships stronger and, and you understanding people more. You know, for even for the future too. Absolutely. We we often, as you said, Australia gets ravaged by drought and bushfires every year, and it's heartbreaking because you're watching families losing everything. And the big thing is that they're always encouraging you not to stay. The the, the authorities are saying, please don't stay. Like know when to get out, know when to leave, so the firefighters, you know, aren't having to save lives as well as homes. But how do you balance that? It's such a balance. Yeah. I mean, it's, I just feel like you have a different mindset when you've worked your whole life for something. I mean, you're, what, if you do lose it, what do you have? I mean, you're, if you have insurance, you're going to collect a check and then what? I mean, yeah, you know, you, yeah, you rebuild, um, but it's never going to be the same again. So it's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a firm believer of the captain going down with the ship or, you know, the captain saves the ship and drives it to shore. Um, before we get any further, I don't want to forget this, mate. You're always a bit of a trendsetter. You're always at the leading edge of things, a bit of a fashionista. You've come up with quite an amazing curtains or drapes system in your home. Um, firstly, I'm wondering about how you would iron them because um, they look like a bit of high maintenance, but can you show us the curtains? Because they're yeah, impressive. so I don't have blinds yet in my house, but when we were uh, during quarantine, we did uh, some cool stuff where kids uh printed out um pictures of a car to design color and design and uh, we gave out some free merchandise so i have four big doors in my kitchen and uh they uh they're all filled with uh paper race cars here that kids have colored and um probably my one of my favorite ones is uh emma tattnall's car oh no nice. tattnall's daughter and uh, Brooke's son, he's somewhere here. Um, I mean, there's so many cool cars and, uh, you know, everyone was sending cars. So it was really cool. Uh, mate, um, I couldn't get the hat here in time, but I, I thought I can at least, yeah, I can at least roll a little bit. Here. I was going to try and get the light to sort of catch behind if I could sort of pop, you know, get this sort of. Hey, you, did, you need to get, we need to get some disco music going now. Oh, <laughs> oh I can so roll that. That is so perfect. Mate, I, I, if I remember rightly, Megan wasn't a huge fan of this mullet combination. When when I first caught up with you guys a couple of years ago at the Nationals and we were doing that couple show, um, she was like, nah. Now she's cursed with it forever because it's a thing. It's not going anywhere anytime soon. I, uh, 
it was pretty cool because the mullet thing, it was, um, I think July of 2017, I kind of had some long hair and then I cut it all. I shaved my whole head. And then from that day on, I was just kind of in this trend set of, I wanted a mullet and I wanted to have something different than everybody else's, uh, ordinary haircut. So it's been really cool to, uh, to endorse this and, um, you know, each day it keeps getting longer and longer. And I did see that gorgeous tribute that you put out to Jeff Gordon because back in the day, Jeff used to run a pretty solid mullet with the porn stash, didn't he? Yeah, he had the porn stash and the mullet. I need to, uh, I'm working on my game here. So <laughs> now at a, at a place like Knoxville Raceway, the Nationals, uh, you know yourself, uh, particularly in the avenue of champions, you know, underneath the bleachers and the main, it's, it's a sea of people. It's like literally like swimming between people. You can never be anonymous. Um, Donnie can pull a hat down. Kyle can put the glasses on. Um, now you've made it even worse with the mullet because you can walk behind that thing of beauty and it's a living, breathing thing. But you're never going to be able to escape fans because you're so um, easily spotted. It's also because people know that you're so approachable. It means you get no downtime at the Nationals. Yeah, and I, I enjoy it. Um, you know, and if I need some time, I'll, I'll make time so I can you know, be alone or, or, or be around my friends. Um, but I, I truthfully enjoy it, Wade, where I can, uh, you know, I'm, I'm easily recognizable, obviously. And um, e I, I want to be easily approachable to people and to people. I think that's why I'm, um, you know, I'm kind of a goofball on social media a little bit at times where, yep. you know, you show people your personality. And I think that just makes people more comfortable and to approach me, um, and times. And, you know, if I'm in a meeting, you know, in my trailer with my crew chief after, you know, I just ran 50 lap a main, you know, I'll, I'll let a fan know that it's not, you know, now's not the right time. And, you know, sometimes it, it comes off standoffish, but, um, you know, I, I, I just kind of put it towards, you know, I wouldn't walk in while you're going to the bathroom and I'd have a conversation with you, uh, you know, just in that, use that as an example. So, um, you know, but I, I, I truthfully enjoy it. I enjoy getting to talk to people. And, you know, if I'm on the move, I'll make it short and sweet with somebody and, you know, running them later at the dingus or, you know, how at the moon at the chili bowl or something. And, and, uh, you know, you, you just, uh, you connect with people and the more people you connect with, um, you know, it's all for me, it's all, it's all brand building and relationship building. And, um, you know, I don't know if the guy approaching me is, going to mm -hmm. offer me a $200,000 sponsorship to be on my car next year, or if he's going to want to buy a, a mullet hat. And, um, you know, if I sit there and not approach him or shun him off, then, um, you know, then I'm, I'm out of, a, of an opportunity there to, um, you know, to support my life. It's a, I have one very unique bathroom story for the nationals, mate. It was back in going to say 94, I'd had a few, had a few brews and uh, I was standing at the, in the bathroom there. Kendra Jacobs right now is going, Oh wait, please, please don't tell bathroom stories. And I'm standing there facing forward, eyes forward. You know how you're supposed to do that Rico. And I look to my right and the King is standing next to me, the man. Right. And I'm like, I'm standing here with the King. So I kind of leaned over because I was a bit, bit courageous and I bumped him. I give a bit of a bump. And he looked at me like, what? I said, Steve, I'm sorry, but I figure this is the only chance I'll ever get to wheel the king. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> Mate, can I ask you a question without notice? Yeah. Many people in my role announcing when they interview you, when people want a picture with you, how would you prefer them to stand? Um, because I like people when they stand normal. Okay, like, good to know. Yeah, yeah I, I don't like when people kneel down. Like, I, And I know there's an awkward comfort thing there where they – people, someone will kneel down and, you know, want to get a photo and that's fine. I just, I think it's, I think it looks a little bit better when someone's standing their normal mm -hmm. height and then they can explain me to a friend that, you know, I'm probably only to their waist or, you know, or their cleavage section. And, uh, you know, that's, that's it. Um, Knoxville Raceway, you've made the AMA in the last five years, mate, which is phenomenal. Um, your, your record there is great. You've had a couple of main event wins. Only recently, let's talk about the one where you um, where you might have got by that guy from Missouri and uh, done the job in the Casey's uh, FVP car. That was uh, that was such a cool race. I uh, I actually pulled it up on my phone. I wanted to show you guys. 
but I passed Brian Brown on the last lap and uh, like going into turn one, the lap before they, they were all like a straightaway ahead of me. And somehow I hooked the bottom. Let's see if I can turn this on here. I hooked the bottom and passed Brown on the last lap. Watch this. <laughs> like this is coming to the white flag. Vakoven thought Terry was going to win. Yeah. Look at that. <laughs> I don't I think Brown thought he already won the race. That's that was like probably the coolest uh racing experience. Um you know, I've had a lot of incredible race wins and chili bowls and um but not too many times you get to pass somebody on the last lap, especially like Brian Brown, who's one of the kings at Knoxville, uh, you know, he's raced there his whole career and had so much success. So it was cool to kind of come in and beat him. Mate, you got two of them. You got T-Mac as well. So that would have yeah, peed off. Time. You know that the promoter of, uh, you know, the Front Row Challenge would have been seriously <laughs> PI double fived about that as well. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, really cool. Now, obviously, that's a great win and something that is very close to your heart. But I have to say the the hard knocks night, uh, which was without a doubt one of the saddest weeks of your life to yeah. to pull a win out of that in, in Brian's memory, Brian Clawson's memory. Can you even recall how special that was? Yeah, I mean, it was, um, you know, the weekend before, um, you know, I, I obviously got the news or a couple of days before of Brian's passing and it was a tough week, uh, you know, and, um, you know, all I wanted to do was to, um, you know, just to understand the the fact that, you know, he, I just, I, I just couldn't believe it really, you know, and it was, it was such a tough week emotionally and, and then to go out there and race and to win uh, the hard knocks night and, um, you know, parking it for, for BC. And that one was for Brian and Brian's family. And, um, you know, and I still, every time I see Tim and die and I give him big hugs and just, um, I just feel like I can, I can provide them energy and um, yeah. you know, make them feel good. And, and, you know, obviously it's never going to be the same, but um, you know, but if I can give them a hug and brighten up their day, then and I'll do it all day long. Rico, I was talking to um, Brady and Ziziana a couple of weeks ago. They were our first guests on this show and Brian had a profound effect on their beautiful little daughter. Um, she just abs absolutely loved, you know, uncle B. Um, it's incredible, isn't it? We're very unique in our sport. You don't see, NFL players hanging out with rival team members after the game, before the game, hanging out with their kids. I, I very much doubt it happens. We're very unique like that. You can race someone's ass off and then go and hang out in their trailer with their kids. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, we're one big family. Everyone, everyone knows, um, you know, what it takes to, to, to be successful in this industry and, and to, and to connect with each other's families. And, uh, you know, that's, that's what's so unique about the racing industry. And, um, you know, especially in the sprint car world and, uh, you know, the late model world, I know I, I don't have much experience there, but um, I know it's probably no different than um, the sprint car world and how families, you know, can travel down the road in their motorhomes following each other with their race teams and, you know, park in the hotel parking lot and barbecue and then show up and race for $100,000 the next night, you know? Yeah. I noticed on your car, there's been a distinct change in the last 12 months in particular towards Shop Rico, like in terms of a major sponsorship. Um, and it's it's a no-brainer when you think about it. Like, why wouldn't you promote the thing that probably is going to earn you more than a sponsorship could ever provide? Um, your focus has been very much towards your merch. And I know that there's a couple of items in particular coming up for you in this month that are very important. Yeah. So um, our merch, shoprego.com, our brand, you know, Megan and I have worked on pretty hard for the last five to six years now where we've, um, you know, kind of had full control over everything. And I, uh, you know, I've, I'm lucky that, um, you know, my family helps me sprint car race, but my number one goal was to, um, to fund my own racing where I didn't have to rely on, um, you know, Avery Vineyard sponsorship or sponsorship from other people. So, um, you know, our merchandise profits or our merchandise money, every dollar goes into uh, Rico Avery racing account and it, 
funds my racing. So I think that it's a really cool story for the fans to that support my, um, you know, that get online and shop or, or buy from the trailer to that. They know that they're, um, they're really my biggest sponsors. Um, you know, a fan can understand that if he buys it, if they bought a shirt, they're a part of my race team almost, you know, and that $25 profit goes to, uh, you know, Rico Abra racing and it goes to buying a tire or paying for fuel or, you know, a hotel room for us to get down the road. So we've been doing a lot of cool stuff. We're really um, big on um, trying to be 10 steps ahead of everybody and really, really uh, particular about our, our merchandise designs and the detail in them uh, because I want people to feel connected to buying that item. You know, if it's a shirt or a, a yep. breast cancer awareness shirt or a mullet hat that, you know, they're, they're at, they're getting something that, that I'm directly sending them, you know, obviously we're not making this stuff, but we're purchasing it from, uh, from a third party and they are, uh, you know, which a lot of, uh, um, you know, we don't design the stuff and we don't, you know, stitch it all up, but we, um, have a couple vendors that we do a lot of our business with and, um, you know, they're, they understand how detailed we are. So they they work through our patient and work with us on making sure every little design is, um, is the correct, you know, car angle and shocks and it to, um, you know, the embroidering on the hats, everything we want to be perfect and sell, uh, to the, to, to the customer. Two very important causes to you that you're honoring on your shirts. Yes. Um, I got October obviously is the month of, uh, breast cancer awareness and dwarfism, dwarfism awareness. October 25th is dwarfism awareness day. So, um, we are donating the proceeds of our pink breast cancer shirts to, um, the American cancer society. Cool. And if people buy them on our store today or tomorrow, they're shipped the next day and I'm signing all of them. So it's some pretty cool stuff. You mean the, you mean the shirts, right? Just, just yeah. to clarify. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cause it says big or small, we save them all, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll sign anything anyone wants me to sign at the end of the day. <laughs> and then um, obviously our dwarfism awareness shirt is our, is our mullet shirt with me on the front cover of it. Um, and then my sprint car on the back. And we're going to donate this to a dwarfism awareness organization. And the dwarfism awareness is just, um, is teaching people, um, you know, awareness of dwarfism and that we, um, you know, people like me and that are short in stature to, um, I just feel like the biggest thing is, is that we, that is treating equally than everybody else and understanding that like, I, we can do uh, a lot of things, you know, do other things. So um, it's been some pretty cool stuff going on. Yeah, excellent. So how do we find out more about the dwarfism stuff? Is it dwarfism? You know, um, com or? Uh, dwarfismawareness.com, I'm pretty sure. Um, okay. is that, or the LPA, the Little People of America, their organization. I think we're going to split it up and do half and half. And then um, I spoke with, um, or Megan spoke with Jan McMahon about where we should donate just because that's kind of our connection with breast cancer and Jan um, and her strong fight that she's yeah. done has been incredible and um, we're so happy that Jan is healthy and doing well and Jan and Paul are great friends of ours so Jan said to donate to the American Cancer Society I believe and so that's what we're going to do with the breast cancer awareness shirt so all the money is going to a great cause and um, obviously I'm uh, you know, very trustworthy of all this and, and we're going to have it in some good hands here. Geez, we've got some good families in our sport, mate. The McMahons, what a great example you just picked. Jan and Paul, to me, they are just an inspiring couple and family in racing. Yes, and, um, you know, it's I. the last few years I've done a pink helmet for October and last year I think I raced like 10 races, 12 races in October and I won 10 of them with my pink helmet. So it was pretty, nice. pretty special helmet to me. Um, you mentioned before when we were talking about non-wing drivers in California, there was a guy that was really handy named Mike Sweeney, and he used to get around pretty good. Now, Mike came and raced in Australia a little bit, and his, of course, his sister married the wild child, and Patty's actually watching at the moment, and uh, I know that she's a huge fan. <laughs> Mike was that. a good racer. 
Yeah, he was a, and yeah. it was a cool dude. He was a typical Californian. You know, he had those chiseled good looks and movie star sort of looks. And uh, he was Hollywood. Everything was like, well, he worked. I think he was a Hollywood lighting technician or something. Still, I think he still does. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. How do you pick your schedule, Rico? When you sit down, do you go to places because you just like them or because they geographically make sense? How often and how far ahead can you pick that stuff? This year was a bit difficult, but in the years past, um, I think I kind of look for what um, financially pays the best um, to win, you know, and, and, uh, and then the logistics, you know, I'm not going to drive to Pennsylvania and race for $20,000 and then drive back to California and race for $10,000. You know, it just doesn't logistically make sense. And, and you can, yes, it's, it's feasible to do and you can do it, but more so on me being, um, you know, kind of the team owner and team controller and manager of my whole program. I don't want to uh, wear my guys out necessarily when, you know, you want to do stuff that makes sense, like Pennsylvania Speed Week, Ohio Speed Week. That's a good grind right there. But all those races are within a few hour distance and you can kind of stay at the same location and drive back and forth to each track. So those are, um, I like doing that week. And then obviously our big race weekends, Knoxville, the Trophy Cup, Gold Cup, you know, so I want to make sure I kind of schedule my stuff so it revolves around the big races and then um, anything in between, I try to just do an all-star race or an outlaw race. And, uh, you know, and I think it's good sometimes to get to those MOA, Jacksonville, Illinois shows. They don't um, necessarily pay the best, but um, I have such great fan bases there. I can bring my merchandise and, um, and do well and not really have any um, competition in the merchandise side at that you know those tracks as you would at an outlaw show or an all-star show it's um i worked in ohio in at a, at a racetrack it used to be called millstream uh, might even be called millstream still uh flag city motorsports park in finley ohio back in 96 and i used to go to attica on friday nights and hand out these little little cards that i print up and it said 2000 to win 200 to start because drivers always wanted to know how much to win and how much to make the A. Is it always about the win uh, money, Rico, or do you look at how it pays down the line a little bit? Um, you know, you, um, you know, it's, it all depends really. Um, you know, and it's, I, I think it's to look down the line, but then I don't want to put myself in position while I'm, you know, I'm just a field filler here. So I'm, I want to, I want to show up and win these races. So I think I just, I worry about, you know, what it pays to win and, you know, we can go there and potentially, unload and win ten thousand dollars you know yeah absolutely um the chili bowl it's absolutely you've said it many times it's it's the event that you dream about all year it is my favorite race of the year um it's it's an indoor uh week-long party for some people and it's an indoor week-long race for some others and for me uh you know i've had a lot of success in that building and um you know i'm, I'm looking forward to uh to winning a few more of them I do love that painting over your shoulder, mate. Yeah, so uh, they did, um, when they did uh, Brian's um, dinners there on, on Sundays uh, the, for autism, the fundraiser for autism, we, uh, the last two chili bowls I won, we purchased the, the painting. Both of them were purchased for $10,000. So I got um, $20,000 paintings in my, uh, in my house here seriously cool seriously it's not cool. about the money for me though it's about the the you know that money went to to autism awareness and you know to educating people on autism and then um you know this is a special painting from you know my past memories that were unbelievable for me do you have the photo on your phone rico of you jumping into brian's arms at the chili I bowl i do um i i I, I got a new phone, so I don't think I have this, the photo on this phone, but um, that was probably the most looking back on it now um, from everything that's kind of happened is, yeah. um, you know, I'll, that, I'll remember that day forever and ever. And, you know, I'll tell my kids that story and I'll, I tell all my friends that story. And, um, you know, it was just such a, such a special evening, you know, not only I won the chili bowl, but, um, you know, I, I jumped into the, my competitor's hands, you know, arms that yep. just finished second to me. So uh, <laughs> you, know, you don't ever see that or hear anything like that. No, 
No, exactly right. Can you win the Knoxville Nationals, Rico? Yeah, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Yeah, um, that's my, yep, I'm gonna do that. Win the Knoxville Nationals here in the next 10 years, five years, maybe next year. In your interview with Stu, you talked about the spiritual side of you, that you, you know, you're an oily as well. You and Megan love your, your essential oils and I imagine you probably burn some, you know, some stuff in the house and things like that. Um, and is, is a positive mindset a big part of you, mate, and where you, where you think? Yeah, positive mindset and positive um, environment. Um, you know, I've, I, a friend of mine a couple of years ago told me to watch uh, the movie The Secret. Mm-hmm. And um, I really understood how energy works and and what direction it goes, and it goes towards positivity. You know, if there's positivity in your life, then positive things happen. And if there's negativity, you you know, you have to turn negative into positive. I'm all about that stuff, and we, uh, you know, I think it, it, it's huge on success and um, you know, and direction. And you know, you gotta you gotta go the direction you want and be positive about it, and don't ever look back. Three words, Rico. Manifest the best. Yes, sir. Just think ahead and be positive. That's that's definitely something that you approach with everything. But how did you meet Megan? Because um, both, um, well, Carson met Peyton, of course, at the Knoxville Nationals. Brady met um, Ziziana on the podium. She was a trophy queen at Winchester. Yeah. Sheldon met Zan. She was a trophy queen at Eldora. Um, and, and Megan obviously has her family history deep in the sport as well. How did you guys meet? Yeah, so um, we, I think I exchanged messages on Facebook a few times and then just built a friendship over that. Um, We have a lot of mutual friends too. So uh, it's been almost eight years now. So uh, we, uh, we got to get to going here. Just saying, right? (laughs) (laughs) You got to get that sorted, mate. Yeah, I'm just uh, buying my time. (laughs) (laughs) You're so lucky that you're so young, mate, because back in the day, we actually had to ask for someone's phone number. You couldn't just like send a little, Hey, on yeah. on FB messenger or tweet it, you know? Now you just, uh, you know, you swipe up on Instagram or however all that works. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure you weren't going to say Tinder. I know exactly what you meant. Yeah, coming up on, um, coming up on 12 years soon uh, in racing. It's, has it gone quick? Yeah, that has, um, you know, the last four years have gone by really quick for me. So, um, I, it's been, um, a huge educational, um, time for me, you know, in the last 12 years it's, um, and I wouldn't, you know, change it for anything. I feel like it's, it's been the best times of my life. And, um, you know, I feel like I'm just kind of getting into really, really understanding and appreciating what racing really is and understanding the people and and the good people that make the whole industry work and it's uh you know understanding the good people and and the bad people and and knowing you know who to surround yourself by to to be successful in this in this industry and um you know there's some things I need to accomplish before I'm done racing and um you know so I need to surround myself by people that um are positive and believe in me and that's what it's going to take to win those races. Man, in 40 years time, they're going to be walking through like Avery Vineyards. They're going to say, who's that old guy in the overalls over there by the, by the wine keg? And he'd be like, oh, that's, that's old Rico. He's over there yeah. just, all you know. All gray mullet and <laughs> on some red wine. <laughs> Make Knoxville itself the town. What I want to urge everybody when they come to the Nationals is not to think that Knoxville is that main road outside the raceway. That beautiful square you know, where the courthouse is and where the, a lot of businesses are. That little city is such an incredible place. The people of Knoxville make Knoxville what it is, Rico. It is. And, and that's what allows, um, you know, the nationals to keep happening every year um, is, is the people. And, uh, you know, from, from the guy, the family that owns the Mexican restaurant in town uh, to Kendra running, you know, Knoxville, Nash, Knoxville Raceway and, there's so many good people in there in all the different directions from AJ at the Dingus. Um, you know, it's like the, when they say it's the, the sprint car racing capital of the world, it is the sprint car racing capital of the world. There's, you know, and um, you know, that uh, it's really important that, you know, people get there and support Knoxville and the museum and, and the history. Yeah. Of the museum. And um, you know, there's uh, there's a lot of history there and, and, 
and a lot of people have, um, you know, built their lives or their met their loved ones there. And it's, yeah, it's pretty incredible. Mate, I can't thank you enough for your time tonight. Um, you missed out on dinner with Megan. I'm pretty sure that she'd probably bring you leftovers or something, will she? Or you? That's all right. <laughs> um, August 11 to 14 next year is the Knoxville Nationals, the 60th. It's going to be huge. I know that Kendra and you know John and Eric and all the team uh, were working really hard on a massive payday uh, for the 60th. I think they're working towards that $200,000 payday for next year and um i know it's disappointing that we missed it this year but to be honest i think it kind of had to put that event on hold and come back bigger and better next year i think they had to make that decision i think it was the right one to make absolutely absolutely mate be safe it's really good to see you again um of course gotta remember that peace out and um Check out Shop Rico. Uh, get yeah. around those breast cancer awareness. Yeah, I'm signing these shirts. So if you guys cool. get one, I'll sign whatever you guys need too. So anyone that wants to get on there and support, uh, you know, breast cancer awareness, dwarfism awareness, so if people will know why you're wearing these shirts. Yeah, and because you have them in your garage, literally, you're not like yeah. shipping them from a different location. They are in your garage right now. Yeah, everything is. I everything is. My t-shirt trailer is parked out front. It's all here. <laughs> I love it, mate. Have a great night. It's really good to catch up. We're looking forward to seeing you next year, mate. See you guys. See you, buddy. Appreciate it. Wow. Isn't he a cool dude? Um, absolutely just one of the most genuine, amazing people. Thank you, Warren Ponting, for putting shop.ricoabrew.com as well. Hey, when you get a chance, I'd love you to get around Methanol Moonshine merch as well. Uh, I'm working hard with the folks at Logo Daddy, and we have produced uh, and just unveiled a really cool ladies' range as well of athleisure wear. Check out methanolmoonshinemerch.com if you get around that and uh, have a look at some of the cool stuff we've made for guys and girls. I'd really appreciate it. Looks like next week we're going to be talking with Matt Barbara and Geo Selzy, I think, was the message that I just got through. So looking forward to that next week. Please be careful, everyone. Look after each other. And I think no matter what, just remember to be kind. And uh, let's just keep on supporting the races and the racetracks. Get around the Knoxville Raceway uh, merchandise as well. The winter range is out as well. Uh, on behalf of everybody at Knoxville Raceway, Really appreciate you spending your Wednesday night with us. Hope you can share this video as well so we can get as many people out there as possible. Looking forward to seeing you next week, everybody. Have a great weekend. Be safe, as Rico would say. Peace out.